This meeting is being recorded and will be available at seattle.gov slash OPCD for viewing later. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we're here to talk about the draft One Seattle Comprehensive Plan, of which we're currently in the public commenting period. We'll jump right in because we have a packed agenda, starting with brief welcome remarks and housekeeping items. Then we'll dive into a presentation on the proposed growth strategy, followed by our first question and answer, our Q&A. Then a presentation about some major elements in the draft plan, followed by our second Q&A. And we'll close out the evening by sharing different ways to submit feedback to the plan. Throughout the presentation, uh, we'll be posting links to more information. And our primary housekeeping item is to highlight how to use the Q&A feature on the Teams Live interface. So if I could turn our attention to the Teams window that you're joining us from, in the upper right hand corner, there's an icon with two comment bubbles on top of each other, one with a question mark on it, and that is a toggle on and off button. If you click on that, you click on it once, it will turn it on, click on it again, it will turn the Q&A interface off. But once you have clicked on it to, once it's on, you should be able to see an area to enter a question. You can post um, your name with the question or you can post the question anonymously. But when you're ready to post the question, click the rectangular button that says, ask a question. And that will pop the question over to our moderators. We'll make sure it's a question and not a comment. And then they'll push that question over to the featured tab. So if we turn our attention now to the feature tab, if you see something, if you see a question in the featured tab that you also would like answered, we really encourage you to use that thumbs up button because that'll help everyone see what the group is interested in learning. So definitely use the thumbs up button. Again, the purpose of tonight's open house is to provide information to our community members and stakeholders and to build awareness of the contents of our plan. We're here to answer questions. And uh, with that in mind, I do need to take a moment to be clear that this is not a quote unquote public hearing. So we were unable to take comments directly as part of the session, but questions definitely ask away. All right, let's get into introductions. I've been talking and I haven't introduced myself yet. My name is Pei Pei. I have medium length salt and pepper hair. I'm Asian American of Chinese descent by way of Shandong, Guangdong, and Taiwan. I'm wearing a brightly colored sweater and thin squarish wireframe glasses. I am the visual communications designer at the Office of Planning and Community Development, and I'm joined here by several colleagues from OPCD. Behind the scenes, we have our communications and community engagement crew of IAN, Aja and Sefriana, and together we're here to ensure the meeting runs smoothly. On screen, we'll welcome two ASL interpreters. I believe Karen Royer is on screen now, and we'll be joined by Lori Reinhardt. Thank you both in advance, and thank you to the Hearing, Deaf, and sorry, thank you to the Hearing, Speech, Deaf Center for interpreting services. In a second, Michael is going to join us. He is our long range planning manager and the project manager for the comp plan. I'll hand it over to him as we get into the heart of the meeting. Thank you all for being here tonight and welcome Michael. Thank you, Pei Pei. Uh, this is Michael Hubner at the Office of Planning and Community Development. And I'm gonna provide an introduction to the comprehensive plan and then have my colleague Brennan talk about the growth strategy and then at the uh, later in the meeting, I'll have a chance to talk about the plan elements and um, explain how uh, attendees and people listening in can provide comments on the draft plan. So I will begin with just a very high level. Excuse me, a technical difficulty, yes. Apologies for that. Um, I'm going to start by explaining just a little bit about what the comprehensive plan is. This is a 20 year plan for growth and a vision, and a vision for the future of Seattle. This is a requirement uh, of the Washington State Growth Management Act. 
And the comprehensive plan is a policy document that guides coordinated action by many city departments that shape the city as we grow into the future. Seattle 2035, which you see a cover of at the right of this slide, is our current comprehensive plan. We update the comprehensive plan about once every 10 years. Uh, the um, Our project to update uh, the Seattle 2035 uh, began in early 2022. You can see a project timeline on this slide. Began with project launch and scoping our of our environmental impact statement. Public engagement that shaped the draft plan itself, including open houses and public meetings like this one uh, in 2022 and 2023. Uh, we have just released the draft plan and the draft EIS uh, last month, uh, actually in March, and um, we are concluding our public engagement next week on, um, on May 6. Later this year, and importantly, there will be an additional um, complementary uh, phase of public engagement uh, after we have released more detailed draft zoning maps and a zoning proposal for um, that will also be adopted with the comprehensive plan uh, as well as the final EIS. And we plan to complete the comprehensive plan and um, transmit it to the city council for their consideration by the end of the year. So just to summarize, there are three documents that are out for public review and comment. The draft plan itself, the One Seattle Plan, which is the policy document and contains our growth strategy. A report on the future of neighborhood residential zoning to comply with a new state law that requires uh, that we plan for and allow a range of middle housing types. Uh, my colleague Brennan will describe what that um, involves and what that looks like. Uh, that is also out for public comment. And then the draft EIS itself and there's a dedicated um, uh, 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 option for providing comment on the draft EIS, which we'll cover at the end of this meeting when we talk about ways you can comment. The, uh, there are many challenges facing the city as we do this major update. Um, uh, first and foremost among those is confronting our housing crisis, uh, the difficulty uh, that many people find in uh, finding housing that meets their needs and that is affordable. Uh, we have not, over the past uh, decade and more, kept up with the pace of job and population growth in the new housing that's been built, even though the city has um, added a considerable amount of housing in recent years. We know that there's more to do looking into the, uh, toward the next 20 years. Housing costs are increasingly unaffordable. We have a history of housing exclusion and displacement. And we know that the city is going to continue to grow. We will approach a million people within the next 20 years that are covered by this comprehensive plan. And with that, our goals with this update are to increase the supply and diversity of housing, to reduce market pressures that are driving up costs, to expand opportunities and incentives for affordable housing, to plan for housing in complete walkable neighborhoods, especially near transit, and finally to open pathways for home ownership and wealth building for all Seattleites. You will see these themes reflected in the growth strategy that we'll be describing tonight and welcome your questions and comments as we work toward confronting our housing needs into the future. Uh, we are going to focus primarily on the growth strategy and housing, but I do want to acknowledge and um, point your attention to the full range of policy topics, uh, their goals and policy statements in 13 different policy elements that are in the draft plan. Everything from transportation to capital facilities, economic development, arts and culture and others. There are four key moves or themes that you will see reflected in these updated policy elements. They include promoting housing and affordability, uh, equity and opportunity, community and neighborhoods, and climate and sustainability. After we talk about the growth strategy, I'll come back and describe for you uh, several of these new and revised policy elements and highlight the four key moves that are addressed in them. Uh, but first, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Brennan Staley, who's going to talk to you about the growth strategy and the zoning proposal for neighborhood residential. Brennan. 
Hello, I'm Brennan Staley. I'm a strategic advisor in the Office of Planning and Community Development, um, and I'm going to talk a little about the growth strategy. So the growth strategy is a kind of shapes where we will allow residential, commercial and industrial development over the next 20 years and beyond. It is uh, has a series of goals and policies that describe what we're trying to achieve, but it's also implemented through the description of place types that talk about the different role that different parts of the city will have and then a map that shows where we propose to locate that. On the right, you can see what that map looks like when you put it all together, but obviously there's a lot going on. So we're gonna talk about it uh, first, the different place types, and then the changes, the location and changes that we're proposing uh, for each place type. So there are five major place types. Uh, three of them are centers. Um, and the first of those centers are regional centers. These are previously known as urban centers. These are places of regional importance, and they have the densest mix of housing, office, retail, entertainment, and access to regional transit. These are places like downtown, the U District, Capitol Hill, um, and uh, Northgate. Next, we have urban centers. Uh, these were previously called urban villages. These are places with an important citywide role, with a dense mix of housing, jobs, shops, and services, and also uh, transit, either light rail or uh, bus. We're also proposing a third uh, center, a place type called neighborhood center. This is entirely new. Um, and this would be a place that where we'd have a diverse mix of moderate density housing around a commercial core or access to frequent transit. And so the purpose of these areas would be to allow a greater diversity of housing types in neighborhoods located in places where people can walk and bike to everyday needs like shops and services and transit and parks. Um, the next uh, the kind of remaining residential focused areas would be in a place type called urban neighborhood. Uh, urban neighborhood would capture places, um, would be primarily areas that are currently zoned neighborhood residential. Neighborhood residential are those zones that allow today detached homes with accessory dwelling units and generally have um, a yard. Um, we are proposing to update uh, the, what de the definition of neighborhood residential to allow a wider range of housing types, which I'll talk about um, later. But urban neighborhood also has some areas with low and moderate housing, places where that exists today. Uh, and we might also consider doing um, increasing that along uh, areas with frequent transit. The last major place type is called manufacturing industrial center. These are areas of concentrated industrial, maritime, and manufacturing activity. The city recently completed a major update of those areas called the industrial maritime strategy that um, looked at the boundaries of those areas and the uses within them. And so we're not proposing to change that as part of the comp plan. Next slide. So next, I'm going to talk through the location of each of those center uh, the place types and the um, the role that they would play and the changes that we're proposing. So the first of those is regional centers. There are six regional centers today: downtown, uptown, South Lake Union, First Hill, Capitol Hill, U District, and Northgate. The changes what we're proposing are one to reclassify Ballard as a regional center. This is based on the growth that's already been happening in Ballard, the zoning that's already in place there. So it's a recognition of what already is happening and exists um, rather, and we're not, so we're not proposing new zoning changes there. We're also uh, proposing to expand the boundary of Uptown as there's a new light rail station. And so areas that are within a close walk of that light rail station would now be included. We are doing um, in the process of doing sub area plans um, for regional centers, uh, currently working on downtown, Northgate and First Hill Capitol Hill. Um, and so those are opportunities for more detailed uh, discussion of those areas, uh, including potentially zoning. And those, um, the first phase will be going through uh, 2025 and the second phase through 2026 and probably into 2027. Next slide. Um, in urban centers, urban centers are, uh, there are 24 urban centers that exist today. We are proposing to add a new urban center at the Northeast 130th Street light rail station in recognition of that major investment. We're also proposing to expand 
uh, urban center boundaries in uh, seven places. Um, and those are places um, that either today have a new light rail station that's coming in, such as a Graham, Othello at Graham Street, uh, West Seattle Junction at Avalon, um, and uh, but there are also some areas that are have been in place since 1994, but have very small boundaries. And so we'd be expanding those areas so they're more consistent with um, other urban centers. And you can see those areas are, um, uh, you know, on the, uh, the on the map as uh, Greenwood, Queen Anne, Admiral, and Morgan Junction. And so for these expansions, we propose for areas with light rail station that they would generally include areas that are a quarter mile from walk, uh, oh, sorry, a half mile around light rail station. They're generally a place you can walk within 10 minutes. Um, and for the other areas, it'd be generally places that are about 200 feet, which is about a seven or eight minute walk from a central node. Within those areas, we would be looking to um, undertake rezones to allow a greater range of, of housing, but particularly apartments. Um, so we described those areas would have could have four to six story um, housing uh, in them. The at this point we're putting out kind of a high level proposal. You can see the boundaries are all fuzzy. Um, and what we'll do is uh, based on feedback, we will then go and actually create a specific zoning proposal uh, and concrete boundaries uh, for each of those urban centers. And so that would be coming out in the fall of this year. And so we'll have another um, round of community engagement when that more detailed proposal comes out. Next slide. Uh, the last center in neighborhood centers. Um, we're proposing 24 neighborhood centers. These are all located around places that have um, great transit uh, and or neighbor, existing neighborhood business districts. And again, the idea is to allow a greater range of housing choices um, around those areas so that people can and those uh, walk to uh, shops and services and transit. Neighborhood centers would be similar uh, to urban centers, except that it'd be substantially smaller and less intense. Uh, we're, at this point, we're generally talking about them as places that extend about 800 feet from a core, which is generally one to three blocks or um, where you can walk in two to four minutes. In neighborhood centers, we would also be looking at rezones to allow more housing, uh, particularly apartments. Similar to urban center expansion areas, we are um, going to be, you know, after public engagement, we'll be creating more detailed proposals, which will come out in the fall, and we'll have another round of engagement on those. Next slide. This is an example of what those uh, uh, neighborhood centers could develop over time. Um, uh, again, these are meant to, you can see that in this case, it's kind of uh, a couple blocks in both directions. It would allow for housing of a range um, but up, up to six stories right along the commercial core, and then more four and five stories um, towards the edges. The last uh, place type that we're proposing change is urban neighborhoods. Again, these are areas that are predominantly zoned neighborhood residential today. Uh, neighborhood residential represents the majority of our city and uh, would continue uh, to do so under this proposal. Um, However, the, the major changes are that we are, would update the definition of neighborhood residential. We'll show some of that looks like. But the overall concept is that there's a new state law that has passed that requires cities to allow at least four units on every lot that is currently um, focused on single family homes. So we would uh, need to meet that standard for uh, allowing at least four lots on, on, on these units, or sorry, four units on these lots. Um, and six units in areas that are near major transit, such as light rail, um, or if they have at least two are set aside for affordable housing. Uh, we are also would be considering um, rezones just for those blocks that directly abut frequent transit corridors. Uh, and you can see on this map, uh, those are the areas that are in dark orange. Um, again, we have a, a detailed proposal about the standards that we have for neighborhood residential. Um, but we will then plan to update that and release it in later in 2024, along with a proposal for potential rezones on frequent transit streets and have another round of community engagement. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the changes to neighborhood residential mean. 
Uh, these are examples of what could potentially be built on a 5,000 square foot lot under these new rules. As I mentioned, the basic concept is to take that existing uh, neighborhood residential zones to allow more units on that same lot, but generally have a similar amount of floor area that you can do today. So if you to choose to develop more units, they would be uh, smaller in scale and thus uh, more affordable. Um, but we'd also uh, uh, keep the same three story height limit, but allow more flexibility in setbacks to allow a wider variety of outcomes and then implement some new standards such as an open space requirement and some design standards uh, to get good design outcomes. So on an average 5,000 square foot lot, um, again, under state law, we have to allow at least four units or six units if it's near major transit. However, we suspect that mostly people would do a mix of three units and four units. So on the top, you can see three examples of what might happen if people chose to build three units. The first is an example of preserving a home and building new homes behind. On lots where that is easy, easier to do because of the location and size of the home, um, that will probably be very commonplace. Um, in other cases, people will, will could tear down an existing home and build new. And so then you can see um, to the right, the preservation and infill option, uh, example of three detached homes or semi-attached homes. Below that, you can see a couple examples of what this might look like uh, for four units on a lot, both with uh, uh, parking access from the street or parking access from the alley. To give you a sense of the scale, if you build three units on that 5,000 square foot lot, they would tend to be of a scale of 1,400 to 1,600 square feet. So generally a three story, a three bedroom, often three story unit. If you build four units, they would be smaller, more around 1,100 or 1,200 square feet. And so they tend to be two bedroom units. The last example is uh, a six unit um, property on a, a six unit development on a slightly larger property um, where the units are stacked. Uh, we would allow, while we would allow stacking of units, um, initial economic develop, uh, feasibility analysis suggests that we would not likely see many of these units because of the additional costs that occur when you stack, uh, both in terms of condo liability, a different building code, additional soundproofing, and other factors like that. Next slide. There are two other things that we're proposing to change in the neighborhood residential zone. One is that we're proposing that there would be a, uh, a bonus for affordable housing. Um, and there would be two options. Under state law, we're required to allow six units any, everywhere if at least two of those are affordable. However, we suspect that that would not be a, a, enough bonus that people would use that um, by itself. So we're also proposing a, a bonus um, for sites within a quarter mile of frequent transit that actually allow an additional story and additional floor area for projects that achieve significant affordability. Um, because of uh, we, we expect this would be used pretty much exclusively by nonprofit developers that are receiving city subsidy or by this new social housing authority. Um, we think these uh, would be a good opportunity, especially for ownership options. Um, uh, companies or nonprofits today like Habitat for Humanity are starting to build uh, condo buildings that are allow for affordable home ownership, and this could provide an opportunity to do more of that development. Next slide. We are also proposing to allow um, st corner stores, and that would allow um, retail or restaurant uses only on corner lots throughout neighborhood residential and multifamily zones. Those uses would be limited in a variety of ways. There would be a, a limit on the size of those uses. They would also be confined to the first floor of a building. And we'd have other uh, requirements that would limit the hour of operations and loading to minimize impact on neighbors. Overall, it's unlikely that people would build new corner stores due to the cost um, and, and the risk involved in doing that. But we think this would allow um, people to convert existing buildings, both those that have been historically developed as corner stores, as well as potentially people using the first floor of an existing home um, to provide community retail. Next slide. 
So now we're going to uh, take some time to uh, to answer questions. Um, I am pulling up the questions here. And we are going to start with some of the most liked questions. So the first one of the most liked questions is that there somebody notices there are no regional centers for South Seattle and I think particularly Southeast Seattle. Why are there no regional centers for Rainier Beach or South Seattle, given that they're entryways to Seattle? So, um, so first of all, um, South, we're not, you are the correct, that we are not proposing any new neighborhood centers for South Seattle. There are also no regional centers there today. Um, there are, however, a wide variety of urban centers. In fact, um, compared to other parts of the city, uh, it has a, a high, um, a, a large geographic area dedicated to urban centers. Um, in looking at the criteria for regional centers, we really, um, uh, you know, focusing on areas that are both have a mix of housing as well as a mix of office uses. Um, to date, um, most urban centers have, have not had um, the an interest in office development. Um, and that is the major reason, uh, as well as just based on the density of those areas, um, that they're not currently proposed to be regional centers. As, as we'll say for other things, obviously that is a place where we're looking for feedback. Um, so please do feel free to write comments on that as well. And for Brennan, this is Michael Hubner. I just want to add to that response by pointing out that the um, concept of a regional center is also um, uh, shaped by criteria that are established by our regional planning agency, the Puget Sound Regional Council. So this concept of regional centers being major job centers, particularly um, office and other commercial uses, is a precondition for getting that regional designation. But we have the ability to designate urban centers um, in other places in growth, um, especially housing. And that's why you see the urban centers as well in our plan. Great. There's another question about um, uh, growth targets. There's been some reporting about how this plan would result in less new housing each year compared to recent years. Um, and how do we address those concerns? Um, so it is true over the last 10 years, we've had pretty historic um, housing growth. Um, the, this plan um, is based on a, um, a, a growth target that was given us by uh, Puget Sound uh, Regional Council and the King County Growth Management Council. That sets a minimum that we are, are planning for, um, and that minimum is 80,000 80, housing units. Um, on a per capita basis, that is less per year than we have seen um, over the last 10 years. However, that is not a maximum. That is the minimum that we're planning for. And part of the goal of this is to create capacity for more housing um, so that, you know, based on the growth that occurs over the time, we have that ability to respond to growth that's occurring. So it's not that, that we're planning for less or that we're preparing for less housing or planning to have less housing, um, but rather, um, we you know we you never we don't know exactly the amount of housing and we're preparing a plan that would allow for um, us to adjust to different amounts of growth scenarios. And for Brennan again, if I could um, add to that as well, what's the important number to look at um, with this plan is the amount of capacity. That's a measure of how many housing units could be built under the zoning uh, rules that are in place in in the city in different neighborhoods and across the city. Currently, we have capacity for well in access in excess of that 80,000. We have capacity for about 160,000 housing units, even without amending the plan or changing our zoning. Uh, we are updating this plan with the goal of increasing um, the uh, uh, capacity for housing in the city and planning for a more diverse supply of housing in doing so in more neighborhoods. And that's what Brennan has been describing. Um, um, in, in his part of the presentation. The result of that, when we ad have this plan adopted, if it gets adopted as, uh, as you see in the draft and with the new zoning in place, we estimate that we'll have capacity well in excess of 200,000 potential new units. So if we do see growth that's as fast as the last 10 years we've experienced as a city, we feel like we're ready for it. 
there's another question about why the number of neighborhood centers was reduced um, from 42 identified in the draft EIS to 24 in this proposal. So um, the EIS actually studied five different alternatives, one of which um, focused on uh, growth in neighborhood centers, and that did look at 42. Um, however, the alternative the alternatives are not meant to be um, so they're they're meant to op review a wide range of options, and it's normal that a your final proposal draws from a number of those different aspects. So that wasn't meant to be a kind of our our target or our goal, but rather a range of opportunities that we could consider. And so the final proposal kind of balances um, a lot of different things that we've heard from community, but obviously we're looking for feedback about whether we got that balance right. Um, there's a question about whether the city currently has any um, short term development funds or loans to assist single uh, property owners with large development. We do not. Um, that that is not something that um, you know most of our money is spent on um, giving uh, nonprofit developers uh, the ability to uh, generate larger projects. Um, uh, but we do not currently have that. Um, school also on that uh, an interest in uh, what are some examples of incentives that are being given to organizations like Habitat for Humanity? Um, so I guess today um, the, the major tool we have is subsidy. Um, we you know sources from the levy um, as well as MHA are mingled together and that provides money that we give as grants to nonprofits in order to build projects. And that is the the major tool that we have uh, to help nonprofit developers of all kind, including Habitat for Humanity. Um, so there's a question about the AMI, uh, that is the what, what what percentage of area median income is considered affordable housing? So for generally as a city, we consider um, something of af uh, affordable housing if it is only available to people who are making 60% of area median income or less for rental or 80% of area median income for ownership and uh, uh, that the if the rents and prices are such that they wouldn't have to pay more than 30% of their income. As this relates to the um, affordable housing bonus that we're proposing in neighborhood residential areas, um, we do not currently have a specific proposal, um, but that is something that we're looking for feedback on. Another question about regional centers and will there be any proposed height limits? Um, so the comp plan doesn't would not be have any um, height limit restrictions for regional centers. It generally describes those as areas that are allow are reasonable for a range of options, including high rise. However, um, the made the what actually happens on the ground is based on zoning. So um, again, uh, we are not currently pr proposing to change the zoning on the ground um, as part of the comp plan. But the comp plan itself doesn't limit the, the building height, so those could be considered as part of you know, future area planning or zoning work uh, to allow higher heights. Um, OK. How will the city treat floor area ratio in the updated neighborhood residential zones? Uh, will we adopt a minimum that's equal to the state model code? So the current proposal for uh, neighborhood residential zones is to allow a floor area ratio of 0 0.9. A floor area ratio means the amount of floor area that's allowed on a property relative to the lot size. So on a 5,000 square foot lot, um, a floor area ratio of 0 0.9 would allow 4,500 square feet of housing. Um, again, as we mentioned, easy to get a sense of scale. That means if you develop three units, uh, they're going to tend to be three bedroom uh, units, about 1,500 square feet. If you develop four units, they'd be smaller, a little more than 1,100 square feet, more like two bedroom units. Um, at this point, we are not, uh, the, this, the state model code has a graduated scale, um, so for four, which uh, four units would allow for a 1.2 FAR. That is not currently our proposal this time, but again, something we're looking for feedback on. 
Brent, Brennan, if I could add add to that as well and flesh out um, just in terms of the objectives and the goals of the city and uh, uh, um, uh, developing an approach to this new middle housing allowance in our neighborhood residential, what we are seeking to do is to um, allow and promote uh, new forms of housing, as Brennan has described, um, and also a variety of unit types, sizes, and levels of affordability, or, or the, you know, the, the price uh, that they would go for, from small units up to larger units that could, um, you know, three units, three bedroom, for example, could be large enough for for families or you know, first time home buyers and others. Um, we are very much looking at the um, development standards, including FAR, and considering the comments that we're getting. Um, it's something that we're continuing to study and may very well in the final uh, proposal um, uh, adjust the floor area ratio or other standards based on public comments. So uh, we have definitely heard that the 0 0.9 may restrict the amount of larger family size units that we might get. And that's something that we're taking very seriously and looking at some potential adjustments. Great. Um, another question here about um, the state law requires that we need to allow uh, different, at least six uh, different types of middle housing. And uh, what is our proposal? And so our, our proposal is that we would allow all the nine different types that are there listed. Those include detached homes, attached homes of various kinds, um, as well as stacked units. Um, so all those options would be allowed um, yeah, with, under the proposed code. Um, so there's a question about schools. Are the neighborhood centers by schools or school clusters or where schools will be remodeled? So many of the neighborhood centers have schools, but not all of them. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, there's another question here um, about how we would count garages under the new neighborhood residential proposal. Currently, um, a, under uh, so under current rules, uh, the first 250 square feet of garages is not counted towards the square footage of the building. Um, under our proposal, we would not have a specific exemption for uh, square footage in garages, so it would be included in the FAR calculation. Um, there's a couple of questions about corner stores, um, both whether some of them would be, um, whether some existing corner stores would not meet the current definition, and if there's some things we could do to encourage corner stores. Um, so, uh, yes, there are some, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are some existing corner stores that don't meet the existing uh, standards that the standards exist today or as we're proposing. However, um, that is not a problem. Um, you know, we have rules in place for non-conforming uses. Uh, so if there are stores that don't meet those uh, standards, they would still be able to occupy, operate as corner stores under our proposal. In terms of the types of things that we could do to encourage them, um, we, you know, uh, make, just to be clear, you know, our proposal is um, really to allow the flexibility for people to do that. We don't are not proposing any incentives um, to encourage people to do that. Um, you know, certainly options could be, you know, loans for small businesses to do that. Um, there are probably other idea ideas, um, uh, but we don't have any currently in the proposal. And Brennan, if I could add, add to that too, is, um, you know, this is, uh, although as we've noted, clearly historically, we have had corner stores um, in, in the city. A lot of them no longer operate as corner stores, but you see those older buildings and storefronts in many neighborhoods. But um, this is really a new idea um, to um, uh, once again allow those kinds of small neighborhood serving uses across the city. And we'll be monitoring very closely what actually um, gets built or what businesses open open and 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 occupy even the the, the older spaces and uh, can make adjustments and including potentially incentives in the future. But we're really going to take a a look and see how this um, actually plays out after we change the zoning and provide that flexibility first off. 
So there's another question about how the plan addresses displacement. Um, so displacement uh, is the relocation of residents or businesses from an area due to the burdens that are placed them on them by the rising cost of housing or commercial space. Uh, it can it occur when a uh, householder business experiences an eviction or there's a rehabilitation or demolition. Uh, it also occurs gradually over time um, as the cost of an existing home or commercial space becomes less affordable. Um, you know, today uh, displacement is is actively going on, particularly economic displacement is um, the, the majority of that. So the draft plan um, addresses that in a number of different ways. Um, one is it overall it tries to increase the supply and diversity housing. You know, the major driver of displacement is the lack of, of sufficient homes, which creates competition and drives up prices. So one of the core purposes of this plan is to try and um, create more housing so that to drive down to, you know, to really limit that competition and slow the rates of, of um, costs that we're seeing. This also um, shifts growth to more high, uh, low displacement risk areas, um, places of the city where there are currently fewer options for housing. Um, we also uh, have a different approach to neighborhood residential that we're proposing. In those areas that we'd actually are proposing a different uh, zone that would um, focus uh, on the re preservation of existing homes while adding units. And we do that by um, allowing a slightly lower density and having a slightly lower amount of floor area allowed, but that could be, but then a, a larger bonus so that if you preserve a unit, you can um, get more sp uh, space. Um, obviously, there's also that uh, the bonus for um, affordable housing um, in um, in the neighborhood residential zones as well. Brennan, I, I want to speak to that as well. Um, so there's an additional document which accompanies the comprehensive plan, which we have called an anti-displacement framework. You can find it on the project website uh, as one of the main project documents. Um, that framework describes the uh, types of strategies that Brennan just just um, uh, walked through, including additional ones such as the the you know the um, many uh, different programs and 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 funding sources that are used to subsidize and create um, rent and income restricted housing, affordable housing, um, to provide an alternative to those um, for folks that can't afford market rate housing. Uh, and then there are a number of other existing as a qu quite a large toolbox the city has to um, combat displacement as the city grows and becomes more expensive that is documented in the framework. And lastly, um, there are many new uh, policy statements in the comprehensive plan that support our toolbox and create a much more robust policy framework for as we evolve our anti displacement tools over time. So those Po new policies are documented in the framework. There's an appendix which lists them all. And if you have an interest in that topic, I encourage you to take a look and see what the plan says about anti-displacement, which is much more than we have in the past. Um, there's a question that says that Bellevue is, is adding 150,000 new homes over the next 20 years. Seattle is only planning 100,000. Um, why is that? Uh, so I, that, that I, I, yeah, I can take you. that one, that, that mm -hmm. one, Brennan. I'll, I'll give your voice a little break there too. Um, so that is, um, we've we've seen that the, those that comparison uh, 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 online, and and we've heard it. Certainly heard people talking about that based on that. That is really an apples to oranges uh, comparison, if you will, between two numbers that are entirely different. Uh, the 150,000 that is quoted for Bellevue uh, is a number that comes from their environmental impact statement, and it more or less reflects a complete build out of, uh, of, of every lot in the city uh, without respect to any real, real world constraints and does not reflect the amount of growth that the city is planning, the city of Bellevue is planning for and expecting, which is much less than 100,000. Um, they're a smaller city. They haven't been growing nearly as fast as Seattle has. We've been adding much more housing than Bellevue, and their plan is right size to reflect that. Um, I'm not don't want to cast. I don't want to say I'm not saying anything negative per se about Bellevue's plan, but it's just not a, a an accurate comparison. And as we talked about earlier, the hundred thousand number that we have talked about um, 
as a way of um, comparing uh, the draft plan to the numbers that are in our draft environmental, environmental impact statement is just one way of looking at what's expected with this plan. We think a more uh, impactful and 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 uh, uh, and and accurate way of thinking about this plan is, as I was describing earlier, housing capacity, which once this plan is is implemented through zoning, will be more than 200,000 potential new units. So quite a bit more, and quite a bit more than Bellevue is planning for. Uh, there's a question: Why not make it easier for homeowners to sell a part of their property? Uh, which could provide income for the homeowner and available land for a builder. So uh, one of the major changes I didn't mention in neighborhood residential zones is that we are proposing to um, remove the minimum lot size and allow uh, properties to be subdivided or what we call unit lot subdivided, where the property as a whole meets standards, but people can own the, the properties individually. And so that, that proposal would make it easier for people in neighborhood residential zones to sell a portion of their lot, um, as is mentioned. There's another question about what is being done to address aging in place, uh, and particularly because the three-story homes are not feasible for those for whom stairs are difficult. Um, Yes, we've, we've heard a lot of interest in more opportunities to live on one floor. Um, obviously, in neighborhood residential zones, we would be allowing uh, stacked flats for the first time. However, as I mentioned, we think that there's a lot of challenges to have for people to produce those. Um, so it's unlikely we'll see a lot of stacked flats in our neighborhood residential zone. So instead, what we're doing is also to try to create more um, apartment zoning um, areas that are more four or five, six stories where we do see that staffing happen. Um, and so by those are, you know, again, in, in places like neighborhood centers, the expansions of regional and urban centers along frequent transit, there will be opportunities to create new housing that at that kind of four and five and six story uh, format that would allow more stacking of units. We are also looking at um, some of the barriers that exist to um, doing stacked units. Um, most of them are unfortunately based on the state, things like condo law and, and construction codes, um, but we are uh, actively looking at where there might be opportunities um, to make those easier. Um, there's a kind of follow-up question. What are you proposing to to reduce market pressures that drive up housing costs. Um, I think this is kind of very similar. Again, the, the fundamental driver of housing costs is um, limited supply and competition. And so that is one of the core uh, aspects of this uh, plan is to try and um, increase the supply and the diversity of housing options so that there are more options for people to choose from and to kind of slow um, those increasing housing costs. And, and Brennan, I, I think it's important to um, both recognize that there are other drivers of, of housing costs as well, uh, certainly materials and labor costs, the time it takes to get a permit, um, other things that make it more costly to build housing. Um, the city recognizes that as well, and the um, uh, city is pursuing a broader agenda of, of actions, a broader um, um, array of things to um, um, to address some of those other cost drivers, such as um, ways to expedite the issuance of, of permits and reduce the uncertainty and the amount of time the builders face in creating new housing, which also can help to make housing more expensive. And there are other things the city is doing as well. So this is really a full court press the city is engaged in to try to address our housing challenges. And the comp plan is just one part of that. There's a question about whether any study has been done on the environmental impact and the impact on existing infrastructure of this greatly increased density. Um, so yes, that is the purpose of the environmental impact statement. It uh, explicitly looks at potential impacts of, of um, different alternatives. Um, you know, the, this draft plan does not match with any one of those alternatives, but it is within, it borrows from those strategies. Um, we will also, you know, produce a, um, do additional analysis on what the final preferred alternative is as well. Um, but that environmental impact statement looks at a wide variety of infrastructure, um, water infrastructure, um, solid waste, um, 
electric electrical uh, police fire trees transportation um and so it looks like kind of that full range of impacts um it's obviously i, I can't summarize the whole eis here but um but yes, that that is the purpose of that, and um, it did find that we do have that we do have adequate capacity um, um, across, uh, the, especially the utilities, um, both in terms of the amount of electricity and the amount of water we need, as well as um, the, the 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 transmission um, or carrying, uh, you know, the, the um, you know pipes. <laughs> and um, I will say though, of course, there is both the kind of the larger system that is in place. Uh, certainly there's a, for um, water, we have the Shape Our Water Plan that looks at the wide range of factors that are that um, will require a, uh, changes to infrastructure, which include both growth as well as uh, climate change, increasing rainfall and the um, age of existing systems. So they have an asset management program that would take care of, of the larger system. However, there are also be needs for connections from uh, individual uh, new buildings in the main lines. Uh, generally, those are paid for by developers. Um, and so if they're needed, developers will pay for it, or if they're too expensive, housing may not get built. Um, so yes, yeah, so there will be a lot of investment in that area. Um, but it's part of a much broader um, uh, opportunity to look at a wide variety of drivers, not just growth. Um, there's a question about um, how are you addressing quality of life issues while increasing density? Um, specifically, will attention be given not only to maintaining existing parks, but also increasing the number of fields, community centers? Michael, do you have an interest in taking that? Well, well, actually, I, I don't know where we are in terms of our uh, t on the time, uh, uh, w whether we're near the end of this uh, question and answer session. But the set the next section of our of our presentation tonight addresses several of the key elements of the plan, including parks and open space. So maybe we could hold on to that question until we get to that part. Great. Well, we have seven more minutes, but so I'll keep going and that'd yeah, be great. I, 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 I'll, I'll respond to that question when I get to that set of slides. Thank you for that question. That's super important. Yeah. Um, the next question says, will there be minimum off street parking requirements in any part of the city? Why not let market demand dictate whether a developer chooses to build off street parking? So today um, there are no parking requirements in most of our regional and urban centers. Um, we also, under state law, we're required to expand that area to include places that are within a half mile of major transit, like light rail. Um, and so that would substantially expand those areas. Um, right now, we're also considering the option of removing off-street parking requirements generally to let the market um, decide, as they say. Uh, that is just a, a proposal for consideration that we're looking for feedback on at this time. When we come back in October, we will have a specific proposal. And 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 Brennan, on that, just because I, I know a lot of people have been asking about this, uh, specifically uh, the new uh, uh, state law, the House Bill 1110 that we've been referencing here um, for our new neighborhood residential changes. It's a half mile from a uh, light rail or bus uh, rapid transit, which in, in Seattle, that's the rapid ride system. So um, half mile distances around all of those stations does cover um, a yeah, significant, maybe a third to a, a quarter of the area that is a third to a 40% or so of the area that is in neighborhood residential currently, for example. So a pretty big part of the city. Uh, and that and that's uh, uh, Brendan, you may have said this, um, but really want to emphasize that even if we don't require where we don't require parking uh, on site, that um, it is quite common for developers to build that parking nonetheless, because that is uh, an amenity that um, their mar the market they're building to is is going to expect. And uh, we expect that that even in those areas where the state has preempted our ability to require off street parking, that in many developments it nonetheless will be provided. 
Um, there's a kind of detailed question about um, the area, um, a, a specific part of, of Roosevelt, a small pocket of been left out of zoning. Um, I can't speak to that, but I will say that this is the comp plan. It, update is an opportunity to kind of look at some of those edge conditions. Um, and so um, that, that is something that we can look at. And if, if other people find other kind of things that look like an, a, a strange anachronism, um, we'd be happy to consider that. Um, there's a question about um, is the city considering access to healthy foods via grocery stores and markets? Um, so the, the city does have a whole food planning group. Um, they put out a food action plan. And so uh, that plan does look um, specifically at ways to increase access to healthy foods um, and to address food deserts. Um, I got without summarizing it, um, I, I I can't summarize it in great detail here, um, but I would encourage you to look into that um, uh, as it does have a lot on on that specific issue. Well, and and and, Brent, and, and again here, this is good. I, I don't I don't these questions are getting into some things we'll we'll cover a little bit later. We do have a new uh, an entire section in the climate and environment element on food systems, so it's something that we it, it did some new work and 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 new policies supporting generally where Brennan the kinds of programs Brennan is talking about. But I would add to that is this whole. Um, here we're talking about growth strategy, the idea of a, a neighborhood center, for example, uh, especially ones that are um, uh, centered around neighborhood uh, commercial districts, that the that concept is intended to bring more housing choices and more affordable housing choices within an easy walk of um, shops and services, including grocery stores that provide healthy food food choices um, to people. So bring more, uh, make it easier and more affordable for people to live near those um, places. And also to support the neighborhood business districts themselves by bringing more customers within easy access so that those businesses can thrive, including I think what you m might see is, is more, um, um, support for some s smaller uh, grocery or other outlets that provide healthy food options in the neighborhood centers. Great. There's a question, will design standards be required so six story buildings have appropriate setbacks with landscaping and public access improvements? The new development at University Village of tall apartments creates a canyon like roadway. Yeah, so the, the um, there, uh, all of the zones that we're talking about would have um, uh, landscaping standards. Uh, they would also have design standards about the the look and feel of those uh, buildings, um, as well as you know street tree standards and things like that. Um, this update does provide an opportunity to revisit some of those. Um, we are for specific, for example, in neighborhood residential uh, zones, proposing to add a new open space requirement, proposing to um, consider new design, adding design standards to those um, so that, you know, as they become more dense, that will get good design outcomes. Um, with the growth of, there's a question with the growth around transit centers, will there be increased bus service? And the number of trains on the light rail. Um, so uh, obviously King County Metro is responsible for planning. They do um, uh, they do uh, you know base their um, uh, bus routes both on kind of equity considerations as well as the number of people in service. Uh, so there is an expectation that over time that as growth occurs around those areas, that there will be increased bus surface and more light rail. However, that planning goes on on a kind of annual basis and it looks at what's actually happening on the ground. Um, so there's not, we don't have a specific plan for how much bus service might happen over a specific time in the, in the future. Um, for, yeah. For Brennan, were you done with that answer? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, 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 we've been uh, just looking at the, our time here. Um, I, I think this is time to move on to the remaining slides. We'll have an, an additional uh, continuing question and answer after the next um, shorter, it's a shorter set of slides. And um, we could even take up some of the, the growth strategy or zoning related questions even during that Q&A if there's still a lot of those.
and I'll just add, so feel free to keep putting in questions. I will also um, take some time to re reply to them in a written format as well, so that um, we make sure we can get to as many as possible. Brennan, thank you for fielding so many of those questions. Nice job. And I'm going to move on here. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about, um, and again here briefly, because this is a long plan, it's got many different parts and topics, um, several of the plan elements. Um, you'll see here again listed at left, there are 13 elements, or think of those as chapters of the plan. Um, uh, we've been talking about growth strategy and some of the things contained in, uh, in for example, our land use and housing elements uh, in the conversation so far, but there are many other topics that are covered in the plan, transportation, capital facilities, utilities, of course, we've, we've touched on those, but also things like economic development, climate and the environment, parks and open space, arts and culture is a very important topic that was added during our last comp plan update, and we've expanded and enhanced that um, element. And then some very specialized areas that are requirements of the State Growth Management Act, like planning for our container port and our shoreline areas. And then we added a community involvement element with this update that expands on the policies we had in previously about how we do things like this event tonight and many other things we do to reach um, community members, uh, build relationships with them, uh, support their involvement in um, things the city does like updating a comprehensive plan. So what I'm going to do is just focus on three of the elements just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that are covered in the plan. We don't have time to go, obviously to go through all of these and invite you to take a look at our materials online. They're both summary um, summaries of the um, elements and also the elements themselves, of course. So I'm going to talk about transportation. Uh, people care a lot about transportation and in fact, uh, the, the Seattle Department of Transportation just developed a brand new transportation plan called the Seattle Transportation Plan. So uh, both that plan and our element of the plan sets a goal for our transportation system that as we grow, it, it's meeting the needs of growth, it's supporting our economy and jobs, it's um, helping to make great urban places, they're connected and complete, and uh, promotes goals around equity and sustainability, especially climate. So you'll see those reflected in the policy areas that are in the transportation element, not only um, identifying the kinds of improvements in our transportation system that we'll need around uh, some of the new places that we're focusing growth, like neighborhood centers and others, but also how we shape the right of way and our transportation choices and facilities for example, uh, uh, new policy language around supporting the use of our right streets and rights of way as real community assets that um, meet a multiple needs, um, that we're expanding transportation options, especially alternatives to single occupancy vehicle travel, that we're building a green transportation system, especially how transportation can help to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, on economy, freight mobility is uh, an extremely important topic. The transportation system, of course, helps move freight and delivery. And of course, we have a lot of new choices and things that are happening as goods and services are uh, goods are are, are, are are delivered to homes all over the city. And these are important new areas of policy um, that, that we're doing in this plan and SDOT is looking at as we go forward. Safety, uh, working toward a goal of of uh, the vision zero goal of zero um, uh, uh, serious injuries and fatalities in our transportation system, our connections to the region, how we operate and maintain the system, and also, of course, how we plan to fund investments over the next 20 years. So those are the policy areas that are addressed in transportation. Um, climate and environment, um, this is, um, we did our current plan or the one adopted 10 years ago, uh, does address climate and the environment, but we have a new, uh, along with a uh, middle housing bill from the state, there's another very important new requirement in the Growth Management Act that all cities have a very robust uh, element or chapter on climate. Um, uh, and we, we so we've expanded what we had in the comp plan and renamed it as climate environment. It has two major uh, 
uh, well, we, the state calls them sub elements. Uh, these are you know, you know, the sections of the plan. The first one dealing with reducing our carbon pollution. Think of that as the greenhouse gases uh, setting uh, and aligning with the city's broad goal to become carbon neutral by the year 2050, which is just a little bit after the the out the you know the 20 year period of this plan. So this is really setting the course toward uh, getting to um, working toward that goal and also reflects that it's not just transportation that contributes to greenhouse gases, but also other sectors of what the comp plan touches on, like our buildings and our development pattern, uh, energy systems, and even solid waste um, that all emit um, greenhouse gas um, and carbon pollution gases. Uh, the other major sub element under climate is a resilience in the face of the impacts that unfortunately we are all uh, starting to feel um, you know, probably more sooner than we than, 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 than we imagined from climate change. Um, this is a very much a community-based climate resilience approach that we take in this plan um, and it addresses each of several major areas where uh, impacts from climate are, are and being felt now and are expected to get worse in the future. Uh, heat and smoke, uh, sea level rise and flooding, uh, uh, more intense uh, storms and longer dry, dry periods. Um, and also uh, talks about the role of different, um, several different key elements of our urban environment that um, where we can build resilience and also help to um, make communities themselves more resilient. A key one is tree canopy. Um, there was a question earlier about trees and 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 um, uh, there's an entire section that talks about our tree canopy um, and different approaches to attaining the city's goals around expanding the tree canopy and the role that it plays um, in um, in um, mitigating urban heat island or other stressors from that from impacts of climate. Our water uh, quality and quantity and then healthy food systems. There's an entire section in climate and environment specifically about food. Um, so you'll see many of the concerns addressed, uh, asked about in that prior question are um, um, addressed you know, in, 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 in quite a bit of detail under the food system section in this element. And then finally, parks and open space. Um, we uh, this is a required element of the comprehensive plan, uh, but one uh, like other elements we've expanded and um, given a lot of new thought to in coordination with Seattle Parks and Recreation, who are also developing their own long range plan at right about the same time that we are developing this comprehensive plan. So we work very closely with other departments. Um, and the emphasis here in parks and open space is certainly meeting the needs as, as we grow into the future, but also taking a fresh look at what assets we have in the city to provide um, currently to provide recreational, social, cultural, and other health benefits, um, not only parks and recreation properties, but also other open spaces and public gathering and, 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 and public amenities uh, that are in the public realm across the city. Um, we, uh, there's a strong uh, emphasis on equity and community-based planning around public space. Uh, accessibility uh, of public spaces, not only physical physical accessibility, but also um, cultural and um, accessibility to different communities. Um, we know that uh, as a as a highly urbanized um, city, that the future of parks and open space is not uh, a large expansion of our of our park system and our open space system. Although strategically, we certainly can add to our uh, uh, land to what's available as we grow as a community, but rather making um, uh, better use of the um, parks and open spaces we have through opportunities for recreation, activating those spaces to be more interesting, engaging, and meeting the needs and desires of people who live in neighborhoods and programming. Uh, doing a better job on operations and maintenance, partnering with communities and other organizations and agencies, and making sure that our parks and open spaces are resilient to climate change themselves as places we want to be really thriving, healthy open spaces. So that's a very quick summary of just three of the elements in the plan. I'm, we're happy to take any questions about any of those three 
or any um, of the other topic areas that are covered in other elements, um, as well as if there are any continuing questions about growth strategy and zoning. So we have another 10 minutes or so, and why don't we open it up for some, some more questions? And Brennan or somebody else can see the questions. I, I can't, I'm looking at my screen with the, with the slides, so you'll have to let me know. Great, I can I can feed some up. Um, is there anything being done to expand access to air conditioning in light of the recent heat waves to make sure that we are safe in our homes as climate change worsens? Yeah, that's a good. That's a great question. Um, well, of course, air conditioning um, um, or, and areas to to cool off during the heat or something can be provided in private homes or other you know commercial spaces, but also in public facilities. So the comp plan um, does does address and talk about the um, things the city can do to um, provide um, areas to cool off in um, in uh, uh, city uh, buildings and facilities. Um, it, it doesn't address um, uh, air conditioning in private uh, homes. Um, if there is a comment or a, a way in which you um, would suggest the comp plan could could help um, to promote that, uh, that would be a great comment. There's another question about um, the, uh, the questioner supposes that housing supply will always be limited and demand is essentially infinite. Based on this, what makes you think you can ever keep up with demand? Um, I think that I think that you know demand and supply are not yes or no. There is it's um, uh, I, one. I think that demand is not infinite. Um, certainly, people will continue to grow here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with the growth that's happening, we have that we have a question of should we provide housing for those people or not? And I think um, it is important. So while certainly nobody's ever thinking that we're going to meet all of the demand and housing will become cheap, but I think it is important to uh, the uh, plan is to try and create more housing to help to you know, limit those um, cost increases. Yeah, and I would point um, uh, 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 to our housing appendix, which is a doc is part of the plan. It's also we also have a draft that's available of that housing appendix. It is a very detailed data report that quantifies uh, in a number of different ways what we know of, uh, uh, about the unmet housing need in the region and the housing needs over the next 20 years. So this is a very data informed. Uh, approach is not uh, and any assumptions or um, you know how we're how we're approaching growth and housing over the next 20 years is very much informed by the best available data and analysis. So I invite you to take a look at the appendix and hope that it helps answer that question as well. Uh, Michael, question for you: the the regional center format will provide room for office centers and greater funds for entrepreneurship. So if this plan is for 20 years from now, why are we being judged slowly solely on today? rather than tomorrow. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that that's a follow up question to the one earlier about why we aren't promoting a regional center in um, southeast Seattle. Um, um, well, I think that the, the, the basic idea of um, does the comprehensive plan generally are we planning for today or tomorrow is we're doing a little bit of both we we design a plan based on what we know about what communities are like and 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 what we do today and what we know about future change and future community needs and growth overall um uh i mean the two things i would say there are um you know and i'll just reiterate that we have regional criteria for a regional center which um are based both on what's on the ground now in terms of how many people, how many jobs in a proposed regional center and how many we're planning for and expecting in the future. And there, there aren't any locations in Southeast Seattle that come anywhere close to the current conditions criteria. Um, but I really wanna emphasize that the urban center designation and there are many of them in that part of the city and in many are in other across the city I have many of the same um, expectations in terms of the kinds of places urban play great urban places we're trying to create through our planning as well as providing access to things like federal transportation dollars there's a new 
uh, designation called countywide center. This is getting a little wonky, and I, I, I apologize for that, but it's important. It's equivalent to that regional center designation. And one of the things we're doing with our urban centers is working to have uh, all of those places meet those countywide center criteria and then be able to um, leverage that status for investment um, going forward. And it is certainly, um, I mean, as far as economic development and support for small businesses, um, the city's efforts in economic development and business support are not limited to regional centers. They would very much be in urban centers and even other other parts of the city as well. I hope that answers the question. Um, I'll take this one. Will you please give a precise definition of affordable housing? This is taxpayer subsidized housing, correct? Um, so the city defines affordable housing is any housing in which the occupant doesn't have to pay more than 30 percent of their income uh, for uh, for housing prices. However, we don't really use that as regulatory term. We actually talk about um, different types uh, of we're talking low income housing, very low income housing, moderate uh, income housing. And those uh, those terms refer to housing that is what we call rent and income restricted, meaning that the um, household has to show that they are earn less than a certain amount in order to occupy the units. And then the rent or the sales price is also capped, so they're not paying more than 30% of their income um, in housing prices. Uh, so when we talk about things like a bonus for low income housing, that really would only be for low, for um, that explicit rent and income restricted housing. So how does that get built? The vast majority of those units are um, built because there is a subsidy from the city um, that helps to uh, pay the difference between what we call a cost to build and what you can get in rent or sales. Um, however, there also are programs like mandatory housing affordability um, in which uh, new development is required either to build units on site or pay into a fund. Um, and so some of those are done through that program as well. Hey, Brennan, one thing I would uh, just add to that description, that was a good one, is that the funding sources for affordable housing are not just city sources. There are a whole range of subsidy sources that the city and affordable housing providers uh, um, use, um, you know, from uh, federal, state, even, even philanthropic sources. So there's a whole array of subsidy sources, not just, not just city, but city is a very important one, especially with new tools like our recently approved new housing levy. Um, there's a question, will the low rise zones change to distinguish them from the new neighborhood residential zones? Um, so the city currently has uh, three low rise zones, low rise one, which is a three story townhouse zone, low rise two, um, which uh, is a four story zone, and then low rise three, which is a five story zone. Um, so it, it, low rise one zones um, uh, are, have a density that is only slightly higher than neighborhood residential zones, but they actually have allow a lot more floor area. Um, so right now we're not proposing to um, change them substantially to um, distinguish them from neighborhood residential zones as they already have kind of different roles. Um, Here's a question, uh, Michael, if you want to do. Uh, have you given thought to increasing density around parks and open spaces to give more people the opportunity to live close to them? One of the proposed centers is near Maple Leaf Park and is a great example. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that we've studied in the uh, draft EIS. I mean, in terms of consideration, it's certainly something we um, put um, included in the analysis. So it's a it, it's one of the options um, that's in our uh, uh, in the, if I'm remembering correctly, alternative three in, uh, no, it's alternative four, the corridors uh, alternative in the draft EIS. You can look at, at that there, what that would look like and a discussion of that alternative. Uh, there are uh, among the new place types where we're concentrating growth, um, like the Maple Leaf or other proposed neighborhood centers uh, do uh, have some proximity to parks. 
Uh, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure of the reference to maple leaf. I, I suspect you might be wondering why the one in maple leaf is a little bit north of the, of the park and open space amenity there. And um, certainly if, 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 if there's a comment there that you would like to make about uh, that their better location nearer to the open space would be good for that neighborhood center, we would welcome that kind of comment. Um, it, open space wasn't a primary consideration in the location of neighborhood centers, but it's a great amenity to have nearby. We primarily centered them around uh, existing business districts and transit access. Um, Brennan, can you think of anything else that was responsive to that? Um, just the, you know, again, the next stage of um, this work will be taking this broad concept and um, and then you know, creating specific boundaries and a specific zoning proposal. And I think one of the principles we will keep in mind is um, the, yeah, the location of, of, of large open spaces. And so I think there could be an opportunity there to kind of consider that as we create the specific zoning proposals for different areas. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here. How will the proposed changes be applied? in areas that have mass in major institution master plans. So major institution master plans are plans that we do with large hospitals, universities um, to deal with the kind of unique issues that they have. We are not proposing to change the boundaries or the zoning within those areas as part of this update. Uh, Michael, are there any considerations for off leash hours in city parks? since the number of off-leash dog parks is substantially below demand and making them overcrowded and unsafe. So I would say that that is, I, I uh, um, being a dog owner myself and living in a neighborhood with a lot of dogs, I appreciate that question. Um, it, you know, that's a, uh, that's a kind of a, a detail of parks operations and, and, you know, very more detailed parks planning that is not the kind of thing that is typically addressed in a comprehensive plan. And we don't have any language that speaks to that, I think it'd be a great uh, comment to direct to Seattle Parks and Recreation, um, especially as they're implementing their new uh, long range plan. Um, there's a qu uh, question and statement. Uh, family housing seems to have a greater demand than supply, only somewhat due to affordability. Many young couples cannot find homes in Seattle to buy. Are there any elements in this to address this issue? I can start by saying, you know, one of the purposes of the growth strategy is to create both increased supply of housing, but an increased diversity of housing. And so, and that means one, um, you know, proposing a place like new neighborhood centers would allow for um, apartment zoning in areas that currently have very little. And one of the goals there is to allow people to have um, each neighborhood to have a diversity of housing options so people can find housing that um, suits their needs as their needs change. Um, also, as part of neighborhood residential, um, there is an idea of really trying to increase the, uh, the the variety of housing types. You know, today we get mostly a large detached homes and some accessory dwelling units. Uh, the goal of this is to um, provide, allow a wider range of outcomes when there's new development and specifically um, to try and get a mix of three bedroom units, which are you know, great for families, but tend to be more expensive, as well as two bedroom home ownership options, um, which you know, are maybe, maybe especially good for maybe a smaller family and are substantially more affordable. Um. Um, does part of this plan address prevention of hot spots and maintaining and planting canopy for prevention? Many of the beautiful parks have trees and other are mainly fields and just grass without many trees uh, and mitigate less for hot spots. Um, Michael, would you like to address that? I'll take a cut. At it. I, I'm not um, familiar with the with the term hotspot per se, but I think I understand from the description in the, in the question. Um, uh, I, I, I believe that there is um, you know, broadly language in the tree canopy and also in the parks and recreation um, sections of the plan that speak to how we should, can best manage our park, um, 
our parks and our open spaces to promote tree canopy generally and to mitigate urban their urban heat effect, um, which of course could could be downtown. It could also be in a neighborhood setting where there just is a lot of open space and not and not a lot of trees. So um, I think generally yes. Um, you know, take a look at the, those two sections. We would welcome comments to uh, if we could better reflect uh, sort of general principles to um, make sure that we ha are getting those benefits of a tree canopy in terms of cooling um, the city everywhere. Um, so it's a, it sounds like a, a, a constructive idea and let, let us know what you think of the existing language um, and whether it needs to be more specific. There's a question. Can you talk a bit about how the plan addresses home ownership versus rental options? Do you want like that, Michael? You want me to? Uh, why don't you start, and I'll and I'll I'll pile on. Great. Um, I feel like I might be a little bit of a broken record, but I think one of the the goals here is to try and get that greater mix. Um, you know, about uh, over the last ten years, about ninety percent of the new housing has been in apartment buildings, and those have been primarily rental options. Um, most because uh, condos are difficult to build, most of the home ownership we see in lower density areas. And so I think that the major strategy here is uh, we, we do need a lot more rental options. Those are especially more affordable uh, for um, lower income families. And so we want to get those in, build those in neighborhood centers uh, and um, expanded regional urban centers where um, you know, there's an opportunity for that people to be able to walk and bike to shops and services to kind of really be part of complete communities. Um, and but then also we are trying to have a wider variety of home ownership options by expanding the meaning of neighborhood residential. And again, I try to get a wider diversity of sizes in particular. So I think that the goal here is these are both important and we have a number of strategies to try and increase both of them. Yeah, and and what I, the only thing I'd add to that is. Um, you know, with regard to ownership, um, one of the things that that did both the data shows and what we hear from through community um, input is how difficult it is for people to go from being renters to owners, given the array of choices, housing choices, especially ownership options in the city. And what we hope that this plan can achieve and again, of course shaped by the new state law, um, but things we can do to provide what we think of as a ladder of um, ownership opportunities. We're starting with you know entry level options for owning a home um, for to so that when people go from renting to owning, they don't have to leave the city, which a lot of renters have to do now. That that gap has become very very wide, and we hope with this plan to narrow the gap. Um, there's a question: Building taller buildings allows more people to fit into smaller footprints, and would therefore save trees. Limiting area dedicated to parking would also allow more areas for trees. Is this being considered in the development of the plan? Um, yeah, so certainly um, allowing for taller buildings, uh, especially in the, in the centers, uh, is part of the plan. Um, and uh, and um, and obviously, right now we're considering whether we would remove parking requirements. Uh, ultimately, you know, parking. It was mostly been driven by demand, and so we probably still see a significant amount of that. Um, you know, in neighborhood residential zones, there's definitely kind of a, a, a um, we're only allowing a three stories, except for again for a, a low income housing. Um, but I, maybe it might be about whether that is um, the possibility of going taller in those areas. But overall, I guess there's a, there's a balance, and um, yeah, I'll see with that. So Brent Brennan, uh, I, I I just got the uh, our, our producers in <laughs> in in the operations center for this uh, open house have indicated we're pretty much at time, and I want to make sure that we share information about how people can provide comment. Um, uh, and so I'm going to move on to that. Uh, I, I will say I, I I suspect there's some questions we didn't get to. We will work to um respond to if we have uh, contact information or other ways to get responses out in writing, we'll, we'll try to do that. Thanks for all great questions all around. Um, this was a really um, interesting session and, and thanks for being here, everybody. Um, so uh, with that, uh, our comment period ends next week. So um, this is our last event, um, this virtual open house. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can provide comment. They do have to come in in writing. Um, so one is to visit our, our engagement hub website at engage 
www.1seattleplan.com. You see it on the slide here. There's a, a, a really um, uh, 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 cutting edge type tool for providing comment on the plan directly. You can read different sections of the plan at that website and click right on the document at sections that you have thoughts about or concerns or, or things you really like. And you can put that comment right there on the document so we know what you're talking about. You can just interact with that document and focus on the things that are most important to you. But we also provide if you have just want to put your comment in a narrative and an e like an email. We have an email address, one Seattle comp plan at seattle.gov. Um, if you go to our project website, if you want to send us a, 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 a other you know, a letter or a, you know, a hard copy of something, we welcome that as well. And you, our 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 web our address is on our at OPCD is available on the website. Um, and um, uh, do I did mention the draft EIS earlier? Maybe Brandon, you can help me with this a little bit here too. There are two. If you want to make a comment on the EIS, and that would specifically be comments about the analysis in the draft EIS, not a comments about what you want the city to, um, how you want, would like us to plan for growth. That's what comments on the plan itself would speak to that. But if you have comments on the analysis in the draft EIS. If you go to the um, to our website, um, and Brendan, do you do, can you rattle off the, the the website off the top of your head? Well, it, it's our the, the website is our, our comp plan um, website, but the, I think the best place would be just to go there, and there's a link to a story map which has information about it and a place to comment, yeah, and you. there's also an email um, and mailing addresses if you prefer those venues. Yeah, so EIS comments have to go to the, that other location, and that also has a deadline of uh, end of business day on, on Monday the 6th. And with that, I, I think that's what we have to share tonight. Um, again, thanks for being involved, and thanks for all the great questions. And um, we will be, as we noted earlier, there'll be another round of public engagement in the fall when we um, release more information, more detail about the zoning proposals.